The hardest part was like being sold something that I believed was gonna help me and make me feel better only to do it, do all of it and come out on the other side not feeling any better. I really can't, I can't ever undo it. I could have always waited, but I can't, I can't undo it now that I did it. I began transitioning at 12 years old. 12 years old when I started Lupron and um, testosterone and it was only a month after my 13th birthday that I had a double mastectomy. I was in a place when I make, made those decisions where I did not have my comorbidities under control. And that just shouldn't be how it is when you make these types of decisions. There's just a lot that goes into making such life-changing choices that it's almost under duress when you have all these comorbidities stacked up and these issues. I came across Chloe Cole's case um, one night while trying to research and Google where my doctors are now and if they're still practicing. And I saw the active sue letter in her lawsuit. I am actively suing Kaiser Permanente um, and I'm suing the doctors that um, gave me those treatments related to my transition. My name is Layla Jane. I'm 18 years old and I am a woman who has detransitioned. It's been a while. <laughs> The last time I saw you was, I think it was the rally, right? Yeah, it was. You did amazingly, by the way. I appreciate that. It was your I... first like, live speech, right? Yeah, and I didn't plan at all. I think it's pretty good for, uh, for something impromptu. I appreciate it. Yeah, um, but it's, I really appreciate you coming out to do this interview today. Thank you. I, I appreciate you giving me the space. Yeah, of course. Yeah, your story really hits close to home because... I think you're one of the youngest detransitioners other than myself that I know of, and you actually started transitioning a year earlier than I did, and two years before I got my mastectomy. You were, you were 12 when you started um, testosterone. testosterone blockers, right? Yeah. Lupron blockers? Initially, yeah, they started me on Lupron, and then they put me on testosterone. I mean, it's kind of comforting knowing, like, I'm not the only kid in this situation. But on the other hand, it's really, it's quite terrifying at the same time because I hate knowing that there's another person out there who's been through exactly what I have, even younger than I was. Like I hear like you got your mastectomy at 13, just a few years after you started puberty. And that makes me upset personally. How, how do you feel about that? What's it like dealing with that? Uh, it's very conflicting, um, but honestly, I'm very upset that it was done to me so young and also not to mention in a headspace where I just shouldn't have been able to make those kind of decisions. Right. I mean, I remember being 13, being in the office with the endocrinologist and she was telling me about how I might experience things like, uh, like vaginal atrophy when I hadn't even been sexually active yet. And that I might lose like my reproductive functions and my ability to have kids as an adult. But that didn't mean anything to me as a, as a kid because I was a child. Why, why would I be thinking about that? Like I'm, I'm 13 years old, I'm thinking about schoolwork and fitting in. And I didn't even know what things like, did you know what things like ovulation or like a cervix or fallopian tubes were yet? Not like in depth, no. Yeah, did you know, did he, I didn't know at that time that there were four stages to the menstrual cycle yet. All I, I actually, knew was there was a period. You know, I actually had never seen like a diagram of like a breast, and like the organ and like the lactation, like organs, like the glands and all that until really recently I saw on Twitter, I saw a diagram, you know, they never showed anything like that to me. They just, you know, and they really watered it down and just called it top surgery, not a radical. Not a double mastectomy. Double mastectomy, what it was, right. They just put it in a lot more palatable terms. What kind of incision did you get? Did you get, did you get a double, double incision with the grafts? Yes. So have you, I mean, what was that like? Like what, like before you went in, 
And while they were describing it, how did you feel? I I don't think I really um, grasped like the full extent of this really right. um, at the time. Um, I was just like, all right, let's do it. Put you just thought table. of it as part of the process, right? Right. And I thought, you know, I'll do this and I'll stop feeling this way. I'll stop having these issues with my body and it just never went away. It's really presented so matter of fact. It's like you have this condition called gender dysphoria and your feelings are completely valid. It's indicative of reality and it's the only means of treating this condition. You, I would imagine during the consultation process, I mean, they didn't really give me or my parents any other option. Did they tell you like that you could choose not to transition? No, they really didn't tell me that like I might grow out of it or like they didn't tell me about like desistance rates or anything like that. If anything, they pushed um, that, you know, if I'm not allowed to do this. I'm going to like my chance of committing suicide is higher. Um, that's really kind of. So they told you that um, they more said to my parents mm. and I think my parents had worries too, and they really didn't refute or comfort my parents at all. They just kind of let my parents. Yeah, with they that. really zero it. They really zero in on your parents, telling them things like, "Oh, your kid. If you don't let her make this decision, like, there's no other option. Like, she's going." They don't say outright that you're going to kill yourself, right? They just imply that that's going to be the end outcome if you don't go through this. That's what they did with my parents. I don't think. I was even in the room when they told my mom and dad that, were you? I don't think I was. Because I know they definitely had um, parts of the appointment where um, I'd be out of the room and they'd have sections of the appointment where uh, my parents were out of the room, it was just me and the doctor. Yeah. You see, that's, that's what I don't get because you think that as the patient, you'd be getting all the information on this, right? Right. You'd be hearing everything that they're saying and you'd have the choice of either refuting it or, or affirming it, saying, yes, that's true, that's how I feel. They didn't give you that, that option during those, those appointments. I don't really feel like it. I really feel like they just purely only affirmed and they didn't like dig deeper into the, the why of it. It's just that, okay, you feel like you're a boy, let's affirm that. Let's set you on that route. Let's make you comfortable in that instead of trying to assess the underlying issues and maybe make myself comfortable with my body without such radical measures. So what was the initial con consultation for getting your gender dysphoria diagnosed? That was done, was it done with like a gender specialist or was it done through like a psychologist, like a general like pediatric psychologist? Um, honestly, it's a bit fuzzy because I, I saw a lot of like different mental health professionals in those years. Yeah. Um, but I do believe it was a gender specialist um, that did diagnose me. Was it Dr. Watson? I know she definitely did give me that diagnosis for sure. But I'm, it, I'm, the other doctor that I saw first, the more local one, I can't remember her name. She might have gave me that diagnosis too. I think she did as well. So... So do you remember at all what the appointments for the diagnosis were like, like whether they went into any possible underlying causes, asked you questions like, uh, like, do you have any other conditions like ADHD or autism or like oh, any no. traumas? Oh no. Like they really didn't, like I had really, I had bad anxiety during those years. Um, it was like impeding my ability to function, do school and everything like that. And honestly, it took them a long time. They addressed the transition before they addressed anxiety. Like, and even really tried to get that under control. So. I mean, you'd think that they'd see these two conditions and put two and two together that maybe these are related, that maybe they're not standalone issues because, I mean, when it comes to mental health and psychology, nothing is really disconnected in the mind. Right, there's a lot of comorbidities and everything that really need to just be carefully assessed. Did they go like into your childhood at all? Um, no, really, not at all. 
I mean, what was your childhood like? Like, what was your relationship with your parents and, like, your, your family and your peers? Like, do you have, like, any siblings or no, a certain family that you're close to? I, I was an only child. Um, mm. I really only had, like, my parents and my grandma. I didn't really have peers um, or anything like that. I had a lot of trouble, actually, with other kids growing up. And I tended to mostly just spend time around adults and family, so... So you didn't really have any many interactions with your peers? No, not at all, actually. Were you in public school? Uh, for about, like, up until middle school, up until I transitioned. Mm. Um, and then I kids kind of knew, and I, the bullying got really bad. They had to put me on homeschool. So you started identifying as transgender when you were in sixth grade? Yes. How old were you? You were, like, 10 or 11? 11, almost 12. Mm. I mean, what brought you to that point? What was it that made you think that you were dysphoric, that you wanted to transition? I was just so uncomfortable with my body. I mean, I, I did go through um, really precocious puberty, mm. um, like started around nine years old, fourth grade. So I was experiencing these changes like before all my peers too, which I think made it worse. Um, That's hard. Yeah. And I think it's just, so quickly changing, like, I couldn't handle it. And I was like, I found out that transitioning was an option. I was like... <laughs> How did you find out about that, by the way? Um, well, I kind of always knew about, like, LGBT people and mm. stuff. Like, I grew up seeing, like, RuPaul's Drag Race and stuff on MTV. Um, but I didn't really know. I knew... When Caitlyn Jenner came out, hmm. that's the first time I really seen and really thought much about like trans people. It wasn't until later that I found out the other way around. You can female to male. Hmm. And that caught my interest. Was it through social media or like yes. your, your peers? Yeah, social media. And how did how did how did you find the how did you find out about it through social media? I think it was like Instagram. Like because that was like a lot more popular, those communities mm. and stuff. And like, especially through fandoms. Um, like, I think it started, I was like into anime and stuff. And then I got recommended these communities. Yeah, it's a weird little pipeline. Like at first, like you'll like be in these communities around like uh, like books and anime and manga and video, like video games. Like video games, and yeah. And then for some reason, like you'll see like a lot of these people in these communities are like people our age identifying as transgender. And they'll make posts about like your personal lives sometimes. Did you find that like the algorithm shifted as you like viewed these posts and you started to see more like specifically just LGBT centered content? Very likely. I also though probably affected the algorithm a bit. Um, but yeah. I mean, it does show you stuff that you that you look at and like show right. interesting, but. Were you like directly interacting with anybody in these communities or just kind of like viewing like what they're saying? No, I was, I was more just passively viewing. I didn't really have um, anybody from those communities I was interacting with extensively. Yeah, I mean, even if like you're not directly talking to anybody, it's still pretty impressionable stuff. Like there is kind of that appeal to kids in that like, there's like all these new labels and ways of describing yourself, which are, I think, at our age, like you were like 11 going on 12, you're at an age where you're going through all these changes like in your body and in your mind, like consciousness is starting to expand and you're trying to like discover your, your way in the world, like what, who you are, like what your role is. So it really does kind of have that appeal to somebody that age. And you're still fairly young and these communities, I think a lot of it is presented in kind of like a really infantile way with like lots of lots of art, like lots of bright colors and like all these bright flags. And it's so, it seems like everything, it's such a cheery experience. It's so happy. Like it's like self-discovery and you're finding what, what's making you your, your best self. Do you feel, do you feel that's how it was presented? Definitely, definitely. Um, it, I can see that being a big reason, like part of the reason it was so alluring. Is there anything else that you think made, made you um, like really attracted to this idea? Um, 
I was scared of growing up and becoming a woman, honestly. Um, Because, you know, being a woman's like, not great. Childbirth, periods, um, not to mention, I didn't have the strongest um, female role models ever. Um, I didn't really have a whole lot of women that I looked forward to one day become. And I found out I could turn into a man. I can escape that. Right, I I mean... clung to it. I mean, growing up, like, I would always hear about, like, all, about all these tough things, all the pain that being a woman had to offer, but nobody really told me, like, the pain's all worth it. It's all for a reason. Right. And there's, there's a gift that comes with all these things, even if you don't want to become a mother or, like, raise your own family one day. Like, it's a gift to be able to create life using nothing but your own body. Had nobody ever really told you that before? I never heard that. I just only grew up hearing all the terrible parts. And, I mean, it was probably tough dealing with all the expectations as you got older. Right. That's another thing, too. Like, especially growing up in, you know, the era of social media and Instagram and everything. That, at the time, like, you know, it was in to have a thigh gap and, you know, like, all the, all the expectations and... I think that's also something that I wanted to escape. It's like, do you have some I'm body image issues? Game. Huh? Body image issues? Definitely. Can't play this body image game if I'm not a woman and held to female standards. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of that's kind of part what part of it was for me. But I was also I also had an early sort of precocious puberty, like on the like on the on the cusp of being precocious, and it was really difficult, like having to deal with how like everybody around me from boys to the adults were seeing me and like knowing like that there's like parts of my body like that that they're looking at was that was that scary at all definitely um that was one of the a big thing that i was trying to escape did you have any other diagnosis or like any sort of trauma um yeah, I definitely had um, a lot of issues, um, but I hadn't actually really been like extensively looked at and diagnosed with anything up until I got older. But I had issues like I saw like a counselor um, pretty much throughout all my elementary school years, like the school counselor a few times. Um, I had to see Kaiser counselors because it got that bad. Um, but always after a few sessions, they just let me go. Why is that? I'm not really sure. I think also maybe it might have been my parents not quite following up. I was just so young at the time. Like, I'm talking, like, six, seven years old kind of thing. Eight years old, nine years old. I mean, so like, did you have, like, that. any behavioral issues, like, getting or like getting along with your peers? Yeah, um, I did have some issues. <clears throat> I did um, end up having a good couple of school suspensions. It was the school that actually recommended and told my mom, like, you have to take your kid in to the psychiatrist. Therapist. What would you get suspended for? Um, mostly my language. Like, I... I never been in any fights. Um, no physical fights. However, like, a lot of times peers would just bug me and antagonize me and stuff. I was kind of always off by myself. I'd finally blow up and just... verbally just tell them to go, you know, leave me alone. And then I'd get in trouble for that. they tell me for that. And then the school system come down on me for that instead of the actual what led up to that. Oh, I hope you don't mind me like 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 chuckling or like smiling because no, this is okay. totally my experience in public school. Like this is almost like, really? word for word, except I wouldn't just like it wasn't just the language that I would use. Like I would actually get into fights with my peers because they would pick on me. I I really tried not to keep it physical because I didn't want to start things, mm. especially. If they're not putting their hands on me, but they're just like putting it just like really, really close, but they're not quite touching me kind of thing. It's like, I can't quite hit you. You're not quite touching me, but you're like, you so, know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that must have made you feel like there was something that was making you different from your peers, right? Definitely. But you couldn't really quite, pin- quite pinpoint what it was. Right. What do you think it was? I still honestly don't know. I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> 
I understand that though. I feel like for me, it was probably the fact that, I mean, I haven't gotten a formal diagnosis for it, but I think I very strongly believe that I'm on the spectrum and that was, it kind of like affected like my behavior growing up and like just me thinking differently from my peers. Do you think that you might also be autistic? I'm actually currently getting assessed. Okay. Um, I have an appointment soon for a full four hour like evaluation. Um, so it, it's possible. I hope it goes well. I appreciate it. But have you had a, a screening for that before? No, they didn't screen me when I was younger. Um, even despite the behavioral issues, I think it was because I didn't struggle academically mm. that it wasn't on their radar. And, and right, right. I remember being a kid and they, they were telling my parents like, your daughter's basically not dumb enough to be autistic, which right. is that's not. It's a really weird bias considering that most high functioning autistic people are actually more intelligent than average, but. So you had a history of being bullied and not really fitting in with your peers and you always felt like you were different from them and especially the girls. Would you have considered yourself like a like a tomboy? Oh, definitely. Like throughout my whole childhood, I was always playing with like Hot Wheels and <laughs> following my dad out in the garage and stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty normal part of growing up for a lot of girls though. Right. I'd ever heard from like your your mom or like an older female relative, like, oh yeah, I, I was a I was a tomboy when you're when I was your age. Yeah, my mom was like a tomboy, but um, yeah. But yeah. it feels hearing that it almost feels like you're being dismissed, especially when you're young, because it's like you see like your was your mother like really a fem really feminine? I'd say so. Yeah. yeah, hearing that from somebody who isn't currently presenting themselves in a masculine way it kind of feels like they're just saying like oh you're gonna grow out of it or like right. it's still you must have still felt like even if you were a tomboy that there was something setting you apart from your peers yeah i definitely felt some kind of way about it for sure and yet none of this during the the diagnosis for your gender dysphoria or, or even the treatment was considered at all I think if anything, they're like, this is more reason that this kid is trans and right. needs this. Did you have that sort of that sort of bias and like seeing like how you were how you differed from your peers, how you weren't like the the other kids or the other girls? Do you feel like that kind of played a role in your decision? Definitely. Definitely. In what way? Um I, it's really hard to explain, but like, I didn't really, feel, I really didn't feel like I fit in. Like, I didn't feel like one of the girls. I didn't feel like one of the boys. I didn't feel like, I didn't, I didn't, I don't know. It, it's really hard to explain. I'm sorry. No, I, I, I get that. I mean, when you're given this option, <clears throat> when you're given this option, without any other explanation for these feelings. It's easy to cling on to this because you don't know any better. Right. And I mean, since you were, since you were feeling this way, your doctor just accepted it as a fact that you wanted this, that it would be best for you and that you were in fact a boy. I mean, when you, the moment, the moment you stepped into the, the room, they probably started affirming you right away. What what are they, what were they asking at first during these conversations? I really it's hard to remember because it was just so long ago. Like, but I think I think they kind of like asked about my issues at school, um, and they asked like they really asked like kind of like. Questions that were kind of more, like... Was it more oriented towards your gender than anything? To basically affirm their bias that this is gender dysphoria and that you should get treated for it right, right. and that it's definitely gender dysphoria and it's not just maybe an atypical female or something like that, kind of. 
and a lot of this is typical. Right. It's just, it seems like you were just a kid who was probably on the spectrum, just trying to find your way growing up. And it was perverted into something that it wasn't. Do you feel like you were pushed into, into transitioning? I wouldn't say I was pushed into it, really. Um, it was kind of like something that I thought I wanted at the time. But it got to a point where it kind of felt hard to back out. Like, you know, when I started detransition, it, it was like having to come out all over again. Um, and it was harder than the first time coming out, oddly enough. Yeah, that's for sure. I mean, what was the course of your transition like, though? Um, I mean, when, when after you got diagnosed with the, uh, with the gender dysphoria, what were the consultations like for the blockers and the hormones? And when do you start on them? Was it like very quickly after you got diagnosed? Yeah, um, let me try to think dates here. Um, very quickly, like almost immediately after I got into contact with Dr. Watson, like maybe after the first appointment, I had Lupron. And that was November of 2016. Um, and then by, I was on that, uh, by June of like 2017, early June, I had my first testosterone injection. Mm. Was it, did you get it from a doctor or did yeah. you administer it yourself? Um, no, initially I'd go into the allergy clinic mm. um, and get it done there. The allergy clinic? That's really interesting. Yeah, Kaiser, they have, they have they'll do it at the, their, the injection allergy clinic. Yeah. Um, but it I don't think I'll see an allergy clinic the same ever again. <laughs> <laughs> it was, yeah, I know a few times I was there and I think my mom noticed, she was in the waiting room with me and she noticed another kid that looked like me a few times and clocked that. It was like, mm. I'm probably here for the same thing. How does, that, how does that feel like seeing another patient, like another kid your age going through the same thing? Um, at the time, it was affirming and comforting. Like, yeah, um, I'm not the only one, right. you know. Um, but now it's kind of horrifying. It's like, how many, how many detransitions? Like, you know, like, because there's just not follow up. They don't keep track of how many of their patients desist. It's just, a, oh, I quit making appointments. And I quit refilling my te my my testosterone. I got to the point I started doing my own injections. Got tired of driving to a clinic. Mm. Um, you know, I quit calling. I quit making appointments. I quit picking up my my prescription. They didn't really raise a red flag and try to reach out to me. They're just a okay. You quit seeking care. Okay. It's such a careless approach. It's so infuriating. Like. They're the people who got you into the situation in the first place, and now they're just not going to help. Did you get any guidance on like how to go off these treatments? Oh no, I just kind of um, cold turkey, basically the testosterone. I got sick of doing the injections, and it was getting tougher to do it because I had to do them like in my stomach, like subcutaneous, you know. Mm -hmm. And I had some weight fluctuations in the area that just made it more difficult to do the injection. And I think I, I mentioned this to my, my endo a few times and she didn't really follow up on that or give me any help. So I was like, all right, I guess I'm going off this. Um, not really enjoying the effects anymore anyway. Cause I got to the point is like, why am I taking this? I'm shaving all of the hair that I'm growing. Really, it was only the energy boost. Mm kind of, that I was getting. Do you feel like in a way, like you're dependent on it, like emotionally or like addicted to it? Oh yeah, well, yeah, once I was on for so long, if I missed the injection, you know, um, or I was late, I definitely felt it. I had had like mood swings, like my appetite, my energy levels would fluctuate. It it's would rough. just irritate my whole body. I mean, how long were you on these treatments for by that point? Um, I started treatment when I was 12, um, November 2016 was uh, when I had my first Lupron injection. By June, um, I had the, the following year, 2017, um, I before my 13th birthday, I had my first testosterone injection. By September of that year, I 
had the mastectomy and it was only a month after my 13th birthday. So like two months after you started the testosterone. About like, I think three, four months. I was not I was on it for under six months. I'm pretty sure. It wasn't a big timeline. Like I'm sure usually they try to have you on the hormones for a while before surgical intervention, but. And they never said anything like that. Like there's no, they didn't say like there's any requirement for the amount of time that you're supposed to be on it before you go on to surgery. Well, I think the thing is, um, the requirements and the recommendations didn't matter as much because, you know, Dr. Watson was like the head of the department. So I think she had a bit more leeway. Yeah, I mean, there were all these regulations at the time by the World Professional, the W the W Pass, but in at least in my experience and seemingly in yours, they went against all these recommendations. Why do you think that is? I'm really not sure. Um, maybe because they saw dollar signs, but. <laughs> That's a big part Maybe of it for sure. Maybe they really thought it was the thing that would help. Maybe they had good intentions, but just rushed it. I'm really not sure. I it's mean, like they had good intentions, but for lack of a better word, they're half-assed. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's the only real, really appropriate word for it, honestly. Because, I mean, whether they had good intentions or not, you can't ever do this to children. I don't think so. Do you think that this is ever appropriate for an appropriate treatment for anybody under the age of 18? I really don't think, especially as easily as it was handed to me, I feel like. I I think it should be very few, if any at all, underage. It, I mean, I couldn't even get a tattoo at that age. And being 18 now, I've done both things you know I've gotten tattoo I've had the mastectomy it's so much easier to get a tattoo and then it's like if I end up hating it there's so I could cover it I could laser it it's not as intensive as full-on breast reconstruction if I'm even a candidate for that you know like this there's so much more that goes into this it's it's a big choice to make I mean what did they tell you about the surgery um, well, they told me I wouldn't be able to chest feed again. That, that's the term they used? So they really weren't giving you the full picture of what all of this actually means. Right. And it's like, you know, I'm 13 at the time. I'm not thinking I'm not of that too heavily. It's like, oh, if I have a kid, I can just put them on formula, was what I thought. I didn't understand there was like, you know, the brain chemicals, the bonding that goes into that, nobody told me about any of that at all. Like, they could have just floated it by, like, hey, you know, this is a little thing. But that's not something I heard about until recently. I've heard you talking. So. And, I mean, do you feel like if you knew about those things that it might have affected your decision? With the headspace I was in, I'm really not sure it would. I understand. But... Because I was genuinely in the headspace that I'm probably not going to be alive to 18. So if I regret these choices, it's not going to affect me. I'm sorry. It's okay. You don't have to. But yeah. I mean, did they, for the testosterone, did they, they told you that you might not be able to have kids, right? Do they go that deep into it? I don't think they went that deep into it, but they I think they did tell me, like, you know, it can affect. And I don't remember what I said, but I think I said I understand that. And I, under, I think, like, I think I kind of said, like, look, I know I, I'm a kid. I'm probably not thinking that deep on this, but I'll have options in the future. And they're like, wow, you're so mature. But did they they never talked about like what those options were? Well, I could have had my eggs frozen, but I would have had to go on like hormone supplements and had like crazy high estrogen, um, you know, and not to mention it's so expensive. I, I, we can't afford that. Yeah. And um, I mean, the high estrogen level is exactly what is what your dysphoric exactly. self wouldn't want. 
Right. So that really it's either that or take it, hope for the best. Maybe you'll have to adopt in the future. We don't know. Kind of thing. But when how how was going through your transition like socially? Very turbulent. Um initially um when i first came across like the whole concept i i did like a social transition in sixth grade and i insisted on other kids um changing name and pronouns they used to me and some of them did it some of them were respectful um some of them were like intentionally like mean about it and like intentionally just gross and well, that's just middle school for you. Yeah. <laughs> but I I lost a lot of um, the few friends I had. Um, mm. I lost them transitioning. So they were one of the more turbulent people towards it or about it. And I mean, medically transitioning, going on testosterone, going through all the physical changes, like with your appearance and your voice must have like really expedited your social transition. Did it that, affect the way that people saw you? Um, well, by that time, I was on homeschool. Mm. Um, I was pulled out of school, like, pretty much, like, right before I started Lupron. Huh. Yeah, because the bullying just got that bad with the social transition. I mean, what, what, was, home, what was homeschooling like? Was were, were you in a program that was, like, you would go to, like, a, like a campus to, like, interact with other kids and work on assignments together? Or was it just entirely at home, like not really any social interaction with your peers at all? Um, kind of switched around throughout the years that I was on it. Um, but for the most part, I was at home. But I did have a, a while where like maybe like twice a week I'd come in for an hour and like do tests in the same room as other kids, but we didn't really interact. Mm. Um, we're just in the same room with the teacher doing our tests under supervision. I mean, that must have been really lonely though, because even if you were getting your interaction in with like your family, and like older people like you still have to interact with other people your age you think like missing out on that oh for sure for sure um yeah like i didn't have like a prom or i didn't even go to my graduation either because i didn't see a point in it um so it does actually make me like kind of sad i see kids now like posting all about it and having hell people surrounding them yeah i get that do you think that like affected your like that isol that isolation affected like your decision to go on blockers and the other treatments though? I think so. I think maybe if I had like other female friends really that like I think it maybe would have helped um, me feel more okay with being a girl because at that time like I didn't have any friends that were girls really that weren't like mean to me mm. or like. And, like, because I wouldn't say they fat shamed me, but, like, you know, it, it was really catty at that time, the friends that I had. Um, and it was toxic. And it was more reason to, I don't want to be a girl. <laughs> I mean, middle school is the trenches, honestly. Yeah, it really Especially is. Especially with girls. They are not nice. But, I mean, through, through most of your school years, you were, you were homeschooled, right? The second half, yeah. Mm. So, like, in middle to high school? Yes. All of high school? Briefly, I did. Um, I got kicked out of the homeschool program because mm. I got too depressed to do any of the work. And they're like, all right, you can't be here. You got to go to the regular public school. And I was there for a few months, but I absolutely hated it. Um, and I ultimately went back and finished, graduated on homeschool. Was it? I mean, that must have been a difficult adjustment socially. It definitely was. And also, too, it didn't help that I, it was kind of at a weird period um, towards the end of my transition where I was starting to present a bit more femininely mm. and grow out my hair. People were like, but your name is um, a male name on the attendance. And, you know, but I presented more femininely. And it's like... Uh, what, what do you mean by that? Well, I... You know, I, I had about shoulder-length hair, mm. and, you know, I'd wear, like, crop tops and, like, 
some stuff from the women's section that was like kind of more neutral per se. Um, but I was kind of exploring with my expression a bit that way. And I was starting to explore with makeup, stuff like that. So I, I definitely read more as a, as a girl. I mean, I'm also shorter in stature, you know? Yeah. So you have that kind of like ambiguous appearance. Um, which, which facilities did you use like for restrooms and locker rooms in school? Oh, that time? um, I didn't really use the restroom at school or any of the facilities, honestly. Yeah. It, um, I just held it all day. Um, when I was like in middle school and, you know, the transition was more of a hot issue. Um, the teachers did say, you know, we can let you and use the staff bathroom, mm. but I'd have to go ask them for the key and everything. So I didn't do that ever. It's a um, lot of work. Especially, I already, I was already super anxious and the teacher has like enough work about 30 other kids that they're concerned about i didn't want to you know it's that um, feeling of not wanting to cause any trouble right um so, i remember going through that towards that brief stint though that i was in public high school just because nobody really knew me um and i had long hair i you know, i'm short i used the the girls bathroom a couple hmm. times and it wasn't an issue nobody even noticed i was in there did it feel weird though uh, it did but at the same time it's like oh i did this as a kid at the same time it's like and like if anybody gives you shit if anybody gives you shit like i have biologically female right like genitalia wise i'm not in the wrong space you know like it'd be weirder if i went to the men's restroom especially at this point like yeah did you ever like any weird looks for it though huh did you ever like any weird looks for it though like while you're in school uh not really because, you know, especially while it's, like, actively in my transition as an mm. issue, I just avoided the restroom. It was actually in middle school, especially this was, like, 2016, 2017, you know, it was a pretty hot issue. The bathroom issue, especially, like, the boys were like, we don't want you in our restroom, you know, it's gross. The girls were like, we don't want you in our restroom either. So I was like, cool, I'll just not pee on campus. That must have been hard, though, like. Especially as a kid, like, you, you're you smaller, like, you have to go more frequently. Did right. you ever, like, that must have, like, caused you, like, a UTI at least once, right? That, the dots are connecting. <laughs> I it's, think it definitely wasn't good for me, I'll say that. And it's not good for anybody. It's just not comfortable having to do that for eight hours a day either. Like. Did you, did you bind at all? I did. I did. Um, I assume you also did that for about eight hours a day. Oh yeah, I really only took it off to shower. That that was it, and even then, I barely showered. I avoided showering because of that. You were um, so dysphoric. You were so distressed about your body that you just didn't want to see it. I didn't want others to see it either. Too that just made me uncomfortable. Yeah. Did you wear it in your sleep? Would you, like, wear it while working out, or... Yep. I mean, did that have, like, any negative effects on your, your body at all? Um, yeah, I definitely... I had a lot of rib pain at the time. Um, breathing issues. It was definitely hard to breathe. I was constantly overheating, especially, you know, we live in California. In the summer, it's, like, 100. And, you know, you have, like, a whole extra layer that's compressing. It... Overheating was a huge issue. It's the pits. I know a few times I, I wore it for so long. I, uh, what's the word? Not delusional, but like delirious. Mm. I was getting delirious because I was just tired and I was in a lot of pain. And yeah. Did it affect your breathing? It did a bit. Was it like properly fitted or did you just... Did, where did you get it from? Uh, I think I had one from like JC2B was the brand, and there was like another brand like under underwire. The more reputable. Yes. Brands. Yes. Um, because my parents were like, "Oh, it's a reputable brand, right?" But I think I also I ordered size too small on purpose, kind of thing, or I'd outgrow it, and I ain't telling anybody about that. It's just like, kind of thing. 
I mean, did did anybody tell you like binding isn't isn't safe? Yeah, my mom is constantly worried about it. Um, I think that's part of the reason why they were so to let me have a mastectomy. It's like, well, we don't have to worry about issues, the complication of binding if we just get rid of them. Um, instead of like actually addressing the issue, yeah, you know, maybe trying to find some kind of remedy. Like nobody explored like options with like different bras or anything like that with like you know like most girls they're going through puberty that's like a normal thing i didn't get a whole lot of help i was just like here's some sports bras here's the target section i didn't really have much guidance Mm. so yeah um what do you mean like you didn't have much guidance like even while you were a girl yeah i I don't want to say I was. Oh, sorry. You're good. I mean, it was a lot of things too. Like I, nobody really taught me how to do my hair. Like I couldn't even put up my own hair. Like that's part of the reason I, I think I finally just got it cut short is because all I knew how to do with it was pretty much just brush it, mm. brush it out, so it wasn't tangled. Like I couldn't tie it up or anything like that on my own. I always had to ask for someone to help me. Like, nobody taught me how to do just simple stuff like that, you know? Just kind of basic quality of life as a woman. I mean, but those things don't necessarily make you a girl, though. I mean, it's stuff that a lot of women do right. or know to do, but it's not what you do that makes you a woman. It's just something that you're born with. Right, but it's just, like, it makes it more comfortable to, like, live certain way i'm not Mm. sure like just another one of those things that made you feel isolated right definitely yeah so when was it that you started to feel like transition wasn't working out and when you decide that you just couldn't do that anymore that you need to transition i was in denial about it for a really long time i didn't want to admit it to myself i was just i went through a phase i was like maybe i'm just like non-binary i'm just gender non-conforming um and i kind of was used that as like an space to experiment with like makeup because i got really into drag Mm. i was like you know the fancy makeup and everything so i was like cool this is a way that i can explore makeup without it negating the effectiveness of my transition per se because i was still a boy it's a weird sort of like cognitive dissonance and like you realize like you miss a lot of things about being a woman and presenting yourself as such. But no, it's drag. But like you, sorry. <laughs> what was that? So I was like, but no, it's drag now. So it's <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now it's cross-dressing as your actual sex by some means. I mentally went through the same thing. It's like, you've already, it's kind of like the sunk cost fallacy in that like you've already invested into this. And like, it's a, it's a huge investment that you feel like you can't really get out of. So you're just trying to make the best of it. Right. Was that how how it felt? Definitely. Do you feel trapped, like in your transition? I I think so for for a minute, um, because I just didn't want to admit it. I didn't want to like disappoint everybody, because it's like you put so much effort into taking me to these doctors and paying for everything, and you know, and it just didn't help. So I I really didn't want to like disappoint or let down, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, it, it's hard. Like, there's that, there's that shame around like being wrong in this decision that you've made for such a long time, and like getting everybody in your life involved in it. And on top of that, like, I mean, your family, I would, I would imagine, was really involved in this. Like, they were from you from the very beginning, and your parents were, were paying for all this and supporting you through it all. I mean, that's a lot of pressure. Definitely. Yeah, was it, sorry yeah. no go ahead um did your did your medical transition coincide with your social detran- detransition or sorry let me rephrase that did your medical detransition coincide with your social detransition or did you did those happen at different points in time um i would say those we're a bit spaced apart. Mm. Um, I kind of quietly went off the testosterone and quietly started spacing out the shots and going off of it. 
um, and not seeing those doctors, not taking the refills or anything. Uh, and it took a long time for me to actually socially like say something and be like, hey, um, we're changing the name and pronouns again. Um, we're not, you know, and actually say something. I mean, how old were you? Uh, very, it was recent, like a few months ago, like barely 18. So just after your 18th birthday? Yeah. I mean, when you stopped asking for the refills, did your doctors like ask you questions about that? Like, did they ask why you you were stopping? Um, I think I I was like 17 when I stopped taking the refills. Mm. Um, and I think they did try to call and like be like, hey, do you need an appointment? And I was like, no, I'm okay. And that was it. Seems to be a pattern here. Definitely. So when did you actually tell them, tell the doctors and your family that you were that you were stopping transition? Honestly, to this day, I haven't like spoken to my doctors about that and actually said anything to them. Um, you know, because I turned eighteen, mm. so their pediatric doctors is not a point to reach out to them anyway. Um, I'm sorry, what was the when did I tell my parents or? Yeah, yeah when did you tell your parents? Uh, I think I told my parents when I was just before, just after my 18th birthday. It was, it was spaced around. Mm. It was very close. Um, yeah. What did you tell them? Um, I'm trying to think how I... I kind of just dropped it kind of casually. Um, I just kind of flippantly said something like, you know, I'm switching it up. This is the name now. And that's what it is. And they're they're like, okay, I kind of figured because you look more feminine. Mm. And so they kind of just yeah. understood what you were trying to do. But it it took a long time to make the switch. It's a hard thing to admit. But so we haven't told your doctors yet. Have you I mean, have you experienced any complications from any of these procedures? Um yeah, I I have some nerve issues from my double mastectomy. Mm. Um, like How does that manifest? It, itchiness, but it's the it's numb, so I can't feel it where I scratch, you know. But the nerves are still just like. Does it have that sort of electric feeling to it? Yes. As the nerves grow back. Yes, I had that really really bad at first. Um, the first like year or two, especially, and that was not something I was warned about. But yeah, even to this day, like, I have nights where I just can't stop scratching myself, and it's just not, you know, like, it's gotten so bad to, I, it's gotten to the point where the scratching doesn't help. I've had to, like, um, I, I mean, have you, have you told your doctors about that? No. Why is that? Do you feel like they're not going to, going to help? I don't know what they can do about that, really, besides just tell me to wait it out. And wait for it to pass. Maybe look into reconstruction, but I'm scared if I get reconstruction, the nerve issues might get worse. I mean, it's a lot to take on. Like, did they ever tell you anything about, like, if you regretted this, that reconstruction was an option, or whether, like, what what any of that would entail? We never really went down that route with them, no. They never really talked about that with me. Um... It was just kind of assumed as a definite, okay, you're forever going to live as a man now. Yeah, I, I've noticed with a lot of these doctors, like both from my own experience and from yours and from, from other detransitioners, like these doctors, they'll present, they'll not only present transition as the only path, they'll also treat it like it's not ever going to fail. Like they never go into what stopping these treatments might look like or what even detransitioning like what, how, how likely that, that is to happen or like the regret rates or what life will look like afterward. Right. Did, did you even know that detransition was a thing? Oh no, no. I, I didn't even hear about detransition until like lately, you know, um, until I started to detransition. I, and when you started detransitioning, I mean, what was the response like from, like, your peers and from the trans community? Were you in contact with the trans community at this time? 
Not really. Um, I was very, very isolated. Mm. Um, but a lot of the the messaging, like from like the few contacts I had, was kind of a you knew what you were getting into, or I got a lot of I told you so's. So it's just a lot of gaslighting. Did anybody actually ever tell you so? Some people did, but it didn't really seem like it was out of a genuine place of concern. It was just a, oh, you're doing something stupid, and you're stupid. Not a, I'm concerned for you kind of thing. It's very unsympathetic. But, I mean, did anybody press you into not detransitioning or try to tell you, like, you're imposing your own experiences on the trans community? Uh... I'd say, yeah, I've definitely been more pressured um, at least to not talk about it. Mm. I feel like I feel like I've been very hushed. Um, you know, I've been told like, you know, you're hurting actual trans people. It's like, was I not actually trans? I lived that whole experience. Right. What's that supposed to mean? Right. Like, I did the same treatments you did. Like, it's yeah. At seemingly. I mean, according to the trans community, the most opportune time to do it, right? Right. Yeah. And it still didn't work out. But since you were silenced by them, what was it that, that made you decide that you wanted to start speaking up about it? It was seeing your story and that it happened to you by the same exact doctors. That's the awesome. The same exact clinic. I'm glad I could, I could do that for you. But... um. I mean, how did you come across my story in the first place? Well, it was 4 a.m. one night. I couldn't sleep. I was on a spiral. And I was Googling my doctor's names and, you know, Kaiser and the location. And um, the first thing to come up was, like, a My Doctor Online, like, a review page. Um, kind of like how they have review pages for, like, teachers and stuff. Mm. Like, professors. Uh, my professor. And I saw Dr. Watson's and the first comment on her page was terrible co- terrible doctor actively being sued by Chloe Cole and I the next thing I google Chloe Cole lawsuit and then I see the letter intent to sue and I read that in full and then I got to the bottom and then I saw the law firm Harmeet and I went to her website and immediately emailed that's incredible so it was my story that made you reach out to Center for American Liberty and decide to pursue a lawsuit. I mean, what is it that you're hoping to get out of it? I, I really want to set a better standard for care so that this doesn't keep happening. Um, it's not that I want to erase this as an option. I just want to make sure that, you know, checks and balances are there and doctors adequately assess patients before mm. launching them into irreversible treatment, especially at such a young age. Right. I really just don't want, I don't want to see this happen again. Not to other kids and not to anybody who's vulnerable to this. Right. I mean, after you decided to team up with Harmi, you had to announce on live TV that you're about to sue your providers. I mean, you, you didn't, it's not like you really had any previous experience with things like public speaking before. So how, you really just jumped into it. Like, really, how was that? I really did. Um, I, I was pretty lucky that, you know, people from Center of American Liberty did help me a little bit and brief me and stuff like that. Um, they did good prepping me for that. Um, and it wasn't too, too scary, but it's definitely an experience. <laughs> They're good people. That. Yeah. They're good people, though. Harmeet's a badass. I'm glad you've got her as a lawyer. I appreciate it. I'm glad you do, too. What was, what was it like being on the blockers? Well, I essentially went through menopause at 12 years old. Um, you know, I had the whole hot flashes, everything. Like, the hot flashes were so intense. I would open the freezer and I'd stand in it and I'd try to shut the door on me as much as I could. Um, like, and then it was just a common thing in my household. Like, oh, he's having a hot flash again. It's just, it's just the blockers. Um, 
Yeah. Um, the blockers also put a lot of weight on me, too, mm. and affected my mood very much. Like, How long were you on them for? Um, I was on them, let's see, from November 2016 up until I'd been on the testosterone for a few months. I think I went off it around the time I had my surgery. Hmm. So it was about like a roughly a year? Roughly. From 12 to 13? And what, what was it like when you started on testosterone? Um, well, initially, um, you know, I, the effects hit me pretty quick. Um, you know, my voice dropped. I started getting more body hair. I had a lot more energy. I didn't really, I wasn't like angry per se, um, but I had a lot more energy. Um, like I was bouncing off the walls, cleaning the ceiling pretty much. Like it was insane. Um, but yeah. Did it affect you, affect you emotionally at all? Like, did it make it harder to process? Oh, like, definitely. I feel like it kind of almost numbed things. Like, I couldn't cry while I was on testosterone. Um, like, it physically was a lot harder to get the tears out. Um, and it probably wasn't as rewarding. Definitely. Yeah. I remember I used to be, like, it would be harder to cry. And then when I did, I could do it for hours with no release. Was that how it was? And it really just adds on to all the distress you're going through with your other, with your previous like, traumas and other comorbid issues that aren't right. being addressed. And so it really just piles on. It really is just added fuel to a fire that's already going. Yeah. It's a very strict way of putting it. I think it's pretty accurate. You feel like there's anything that we, anything else that we haven't really touched upon? Um, not really sure. Besides, like you know, um, like some of the effects of testosterone that still linger. Like my voice, it's never gonna be the same. I have an Adam's apple. Um, I'm not sure if it's gonna pick up on camera, but I, it, it is present. I do have one, and it's never gonna go away unless I literally get it shaved down like trans women do. It's not too visible though. I don't think you'll ever have to do that. And really, nobody has to do that. It's a pretty... It's really it's a, a pretty rough thing to do. Yeah. It's terrible for your body. But I think you look just fine. You're a pretty girl. I appreciate it. So are you. But yeah, there's just some things from testosterone that have definitely lingered. Um, just never going to go away. Any, like, any serious health issues? Um... I am, like, a lot more prone to, like, joint pain mm. and, like, blowing out my back and, like, you know, like, slipping things and stuff. I don't know if it's – it could be related. It might not be. Not really sure. I think it might be, though, because I'm still young to be having those issues. But There's a lot of unknowns. Yeah, definitely. There's just too many unknowns to be doing this so young with, without much guidance. Yeah. But, I mean, how are you doing now with, with all this and in your, in your own life? Um, I've adjusted okay. Um, you know, like, I have a stable job, um, stable relationship with my family. It definitely could be a lot worse. <laughs> but, I mean, what do you, do you have, like, any plans for the future? Um, really, honestly, not sure. There's a lot of possibilities. We're still pretty young. Yeah. Isn't that kind of exciting, though? Scary. <laughs> I'd say it's a little bit of both. I'm really thankful that you came onto my channel today to talk about your experience with transitioning. And it was, I think it was a great experience just listening to a story that really hits quite close, quite close to home. It's quite like mine. And it's honestly cathartic. I appreciate you having me on.